Over the last several weeks, I've really gone to town on a couple of high profile dams associated with national parks. But what drew me to those topics in the first place wasn't the fact that those dams were built or not built, but the fact that those dams represented a mindset and the evolution of a mindset. When Hetch Hetchy was built, utilitarian conservation was a fledgling idea, itself a response to the unchecked environmental exploitation of the Industrial Revolution. It was the first time an environmental issue really took center stage in the public realm. Questions of how Americans thought about and interacted with the natural world were being asked for the first time. By the time Glen Canyon came around, utilitarian conservation was still the predominant mindset, but those questions had grown a bit more complex. More voices were being heard and valid criticisms were being levied about the role of dams in our social, cultural, and ecological landscape. Each of those dam projects, to me, is a good signpost for where environmental discourse was at the time. They're excellent case studies engaging how our relationship with the natural world has shifted over time. Which is why I want to tell you yet another story about a dam. The last one. For now. And give you yet another signpost to examine our relationship with the natural world. That story is about the Elwha Dam. Specifically, the removal of the Elwha Dam. I think it provides a nice conclusion to this damn narrative, so let's get started. First things first, I want to tell you a little bit about this area of the country. The Elwha River is located on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State. For most of its length, it is protected within what is now Olympic National Park. This area is the ancestral home of the Lower Elwha Klallam Tribe, who hold this land sacred and whose creation site lies along the Elwha's banks. Of particular importance to the Lower Elwha Klallam are the river's salmon. Prior to the construction of the dams, the Elwha was home to 10 species of anadromous fish, which are species that migrate from the ocean to rivers to reproduce. This included all five species of Pacific salmon. You might also have heard that the Pacific Northwest is quite wet. In fact, the Olympic Peninsula is one of the wettest places in the United States, receiving over 20 feet of rain annually in some areas. Given that fact, you might be wondering just why a dam was needed here in the first place. If they get so much rainfall and water's not really an issue, why build a dam? Well, as we've seen, dams are not just built for water storage. They can be used for irrigation, flood control, recreation, and in the case of the Elwha, hydropower. See, at the turn of the 20th century, the town of Port Angeles, located on the peninsula's northern coast, was growing and developing and expanding as a center for logging operations. To support those operations, it had an increasing need for power. Canadian entrepreneur Thomas Aldwell wanted to capitalize on this need. He saw the Elwha, just a few short miles away, with its narrow gorges and steep canyons, as a prime candidate for a hydropower dam that would ultimately power a pulp mill in Port Angeles. And so, in 1910, the Olympic Power Company was formed, and construction began on the Elwha Dam. It was completed three years later in 1913. It was also around this time, in 1909, that Mount Olympus National Monument was established and administered by the U.S. Forest Service. And although the Elwha Dam was not located within the new monument's boundaries, 14 years later, more growth and more development called for more power, and the Glines Canyon Dam was constructed, this time well within the boundaries of the monument. Unlike Hetch Hetchy or Dinosaur though, there wasn't a lot of opposition surrounding these dams at the time. The Elwha Dam was not even on federal public land, and the Glines Canyon Dam was located in a national monument administered by the U.S. Forest Service, whose approach to land management allowed these sorts of uses. Remember, the philosophy of the Forest Service was shaped by Gifford Pinchot, who advocated for an approach called utilitarian conservation, where natural resources were managed to produce the greatest good for the greatest number of people. This resulted in two largely uncontroversial dams, both of which were seen as necessary and perfectly acceptable uses of the Elwha River. Except, those who deemed them non-controversial were not the only ones with opinions on the matter, namely, the Lower Elwha Klallam tribe. The new dams would significantly alter the ecosystem they had relied on for thousands of years. As constructed, the dams would significantly inhibit salmon migration up the Elwha River, which the Lower Elwha Klallam relied upon for food, economy, and culture. The state of Washington even had a law prohibiting dams which blocked salmon migration. That was not to stop these projects, however. In order to get around the statute, the state fish commissioner, Leslie Darwin, 
declared that the Elwha Dam would actually be considered a hatchery rack, where the dam would essentially be used as a holding area to collect salmon for hatcheries. This was the beginning of a long and controversial history of dams and salmon. The fish commissioner had essentially institutionalized a way of thinking that equated dams with actually being good for salmon, despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. After construction of the Elwha Dam began in 1911, the local warden, J.W. Pike, wrote to the fish commissioner, stating, quote, I have personally searched the Elwha River and tributaries above the dam and have been unable to find a single salmon. There appear to be thousands of salmon at the foot of the dam, where they are jumping continuously, end quote. Here was the utilitarian conservation philosophy being warped and contorted in order to accommodate a narrow set of interests. The Elwha Dam hatchery scheme would fail in less than a decade leaving the Elwha blocked and salmon with less than five miles of habitat downstream. Combined with the impacts of Glines Canyon Dam, salmon numbers plummeted. Prior to the dams, roughly 400,000 salmon returned to the Elwha annually, but after their construction, only 3,000 made the journey home. They became locally extinct or critically endangered throughout the Elwha watershed. And without its keystone species, the Elwha ecosystem suffered as well. Without the nutrients salmon brought upstream, a vital link between the ocean and the river was severed. When the salmon came upstream, they provided food for animals like bears and eagles. When they died, their decomposing bodies nourished the Elwha streamside habitats. In both cases, the salmon brought large amounts of oceanic carbon and nitrogen back to this freshwater ecosystem, essentially acting like supercharged fertilizer. No salmon means no fertilizer. But it wasn't just salmon. The two dams prevented the Elwha itself from depositing sediment at the coast, causing the estuary at its mouth to shrink. A diminished estuary meant diminished habitat for species which relied on the estuary, things like crabs and shrimp and seabirds. The buildup of sediment behind the dams also meant that what little habitat salmon did have downstream of them was degraded, since things like tree stumps and pebbles weren't deposited anymore. Those are areas salmon would have used for spawning. The Lower Elwha Clallam, of course, felt these impacts acutely. In addition to their creation site being drowned beneath a reservoir, this was a fish and an ecosystem they had relied on for thousands of years. That ecosystem was now clogged behind the concrete masses of the Elwha and Glines Canyon dams. Eventually, though, things did begin to change. In 1974, a landmark court ruling dubbed the Bolt Decision guaranteed native fishing rights in Washington state entitling them to 50% of the state's harvestable catch. This case had broader implications for salmon on the Elwha though, as further interpretations of the case have obligated the state to protect fish habitat. Given the impacts of the Elwha and Glines Canyon dams on salmon habitat, the argument for river restoration now had legal backing. In the next few decades, calls for river restoration grew louder. Then, in 1992, thanks to continued advocacy from the Lower Elwha Clallam tribe, environmental groups, and the National Park Service, Congress passed the Elwha River Ecosystem and Fisheries Restoration Act, authorizing the Park Service to acquire and decommission the Elwha and Glines Canyon dams. This was an unprecedented step. These would be some of the biggest dams ever decommissioned in favor of habitat restoration. These sorts of conversations just weren't happening prior to 1992, at least not ones that were publicly significant in any way. From the Hetch Hetchy Valley to the Olympic Peninsula, the issue of dams in national parks had come full circle. Public opinion had shifted, more voices were heard, more interests were taken into account. The Elwha would run free. 20 years later, it took a while to get everything all sorted out. But in 2011, the Elwha Dam was removed, and in 2014, the Glines Canyon Dam followed. Now the Elwha ran free. This is a restoration which will take decades to fully come into its own, but that's not to say its impacts aren't already being seen. Salmon returned just months after the dams came down. They now had 70 miles of prime river habitat unavailable to them for the last 100 years. Chinook and coho have seen the most successful returns along with steelhead trout. Pink and chum salmon numbers are still critical, but as the restoration progresses, the hope is that they will reappear as well. Once again, the oceanic nutrient cycle will take hold. The salmon will bring their oceanic carbon and nitrogen with them upstream, fertilizing the Elwha watershed and its inhabitants. 
Already, animals like deer, elk, eagles, black bears, shrews, moles, wood rats, and weasels have returned. Beavers have recolonized. More are sure to follow. With the river unclogged, sediment is also free to nourish the river's estuary once again. In fact, so much sediment was stored behind the dams that their demolition had to be done in stages so as not to overwhelm the downstream ecosystem with silt and mud. After removal, over 1 meter of sediment was deposited in the estuary, along with more than 400 meters at the river's mouth directly. That sediment will provide critical habitat for young fish, invertebrates, and shorebirds, those that live at the boundary between fresh and salt water, river, and ocean. Of course, the former reservoirs will need to be restored as well. They've been drowned for over a hundred years and their banks are devoid of any vegetation. The restoration will see a mixture of native species planted by hand and natural recolonization from nearby areas. Over time, the Elwha's banks will look like they once did. There is a long way yet to go, but the Elwha is a testament to what can happen when rivers are allowed to run free, when they're restored to their natural state when the interests of more than a select few are taken into account. It's also a testament to just how far public opinion has shifted on these issues. I started this miniseries with the story of Hetch Hetchy and how a mindset, a way of thinking about the natural world, resulted in the loss of a beautiful, glaciated valley in Yosemite National Park. And now with the Elwha removals, it seems like that mindset has shifted, or is at least beginning to shift. Yes, there are still thousands of dams on rivers all across the country, and not all of them will be removed. But the fact that these two were, that again, is a testament to how far we've come. Maybe more will follow. If you want to learn more about the world's protected places, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel. I tell park stories just like this one, and you can help them reach more people so they can learn about parks too. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.